So thank you everyone for coming. My name's Ben. Um, I'm one of the people who's been involved in the Uyghur Solidarity Campaign, uh, organizing the protests outside the Chinese embassy for the past few months. Um, we've organized this because uh, obviously we can't physically protest outside the embassy during the lockdown, but we think it's important that this issue is not lost um, in the, in, among the pandemic. Uh, and indeed that we emphasize the, the particular ways that um, during the pandemic, the Chinese state has used the crisis to launch more attacks on the Uyghurs and has demonstrated a complete lack of um, interest in preserving the health and safety of an entire population of people. Um, we've got speakers here today uh, who are going to tell us a bit about the campaign and about the issues. Um, and then we'll move on to a bit of open discussion. Um, obviously, you know, this is, this is one of the, the worst, arguably the worst single human rights violation happening in the world right now. We've got uh, probably upwards of a million people um, in, in d internment camps. We've got an, an intense uh, campaign of surveillance and brutality meted out upon the rest of the population who are in theory outside prison but in reality the entire province of uh, Xinjiang or really East Turkestan has been turned into a prison for them uh, and now in the last few months we've had more and more reports of the tens of thousands probably more than a hundred thousand people who've been moved into forced labor serving uh, factories across China, um, which, which supply some of the best known brands in the world. Um, so oppression very much is big business in China right now. So I'm, uh, our speakers today are uh, Nuri Turkel. Um, Nuri is um, an, an American-based activist and a lawyer. Um, who was born in a re-education camp in Kashgar at the height of the Cultural Revolution. He's the former president of the Uyghur American Association, as well as the former executive director of the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Um, so, uh, Nuri, if you can uh, kick us off um, for about 10 minutes and give us an overview of, of the issue, please. And thanks for joining us. For my... Uh, tardiness uh, today. I I thought that it will be in an hour, but I'm still in my sports gear, <laughs> getting some uh, uh, exercise done. Anyways, um, I I wanted to begin by saying that um, uh, I'm personally very grateful for um, the organizers of today's virtual discussion uh, to continue to shine a light on the uh, on one of the world's worst, worst uh, humanitarian crises uh, that entered its third year. Um, and actually it's happening, um, it's dragged on in perpetually uh, in a country that I call East Turkestan. Um, I, um, um, I have worked in the law and business and human rights for nearly two decades. Uh, some of my comments, um, reflects my practical experience in those uh, areas. And I never thought, um, I always say this, uh, it's almost uh, feeling a little bit jaded to keep talking about it all the time, that I never thought that I'd be talking about the way that my parents brought me to the world, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, that I was born in a re-education camp. Of course, it's a very different type of re-education camp, but from that period, it, uh, in, in 19, uh, 20, 2020, we're still talking about the camps uh, that the Chinese euphemistically call re-education camps, but that fits the definition of the concentration camp that we've uh, seen in the history books. So um, despite the scope and scale of the ongoing crisis, uh, we have not yet seen a tangible, uh, concerted, uh, reactions, responses from the international community to at least pressure to shut down the mod, uh, China's modern day concentration camps. 
Um, the diplomats are still tiptoeing around the topic uh, for the most part, uh, except for a few countries. Uh, None of the Western uh, governments, um, head of states, former, current, have taken a position on the ongoing crisis, and particularly in Europe, uh, that survived fascism and experienced Nazi Germany. So um, the Chinese have been very successful in buying silence, and diplomatic pressure, uh, economic incentives, and coercive methods uh, that we have seen in the recent month uh, how how effective it has been um, manipulating the practices in such an organization such as World Health Organization in dealing with the ongoing uh, health crisis. And also uh, yesterday we found out that the China managed to get into the Human Rights Council, which is, um, which can, if somebody tells me that, I probably think it's a bad joke. So um, the Chinese global influence is, is on the rise uh, day by day. Uh, the international community has not done anything to rectify the situation. No government called out, uh, uh, re uh, has announced sanctions. No country recalled its ambassadors. Uh, no country has canceled a trip or tabled a resolution at the UN. So um, with, with it, it's easy for anyone to imagine uh, that the type of reaction that we would see any country other than China locks up more than 20% of its uh, Muslim population. So those people that we've been hearing, the millions and three millions, have names, aspirations, families, connections, uh, apparently that has not really got uh, world's attention. So um, what I, I need to um, focus on two things. Uh, first of all, is it a re-education camp or concentration camp? And um, is, um, is China's uh, policy uh, and a, the ongoing uh, repressive policies, and particularly in the, uh, uh, with a specific mindset, uh, with a specific objective to stamp out Uyghur cultural heritage, ethnic identity amounts to cultural genocide? These are the two questions that I'd like to quickly run through. One, um, concentration camps uh, exist when a government holds a group of civilians outside of a normal process, including to segregate people considered foreigners or, or outsiders and to, with a with specific intention to punish them. So um, here's some of the commonalities in the concentration camps that we've seen in history. The one, detainees in the camps have no real trial at all. Two, detainees are typically held because of their racial, cultural, religion, religious, and political identity, not because of any prosecutable offenses, uh, but the government actors view these identity as the threat to their existence. And then three, the camps are established by the government policy and run by government entity during the conflict of uh, uh, war, uh, or, or internal uh, political strife. Unlike prisons, camps often detain prisoners without scheduled release date, which is arbitrarily set and changed without warning. And finally, camps are extrajudicial in that detainees are not allowed to access to lawyers or courts. Importantly, uh, when the detainees released from the uh, concentration camps, they never told why they released and no compensation was given. So we can easily see these, act, these uh, practices being part of the Chinese concentration camp in the Uyghur uh, region. So is the China committing cultural genocide? Uh, I, believe, I believe the... Um, the China has a very specific intent to debase Uyghur cultural heritage, destroy cultural identity, amounts to cultural genocide. The cultural genocide uh, was not clearly def defined in the international law. Although it was mentioned uh, when the drafters working on the 1949 Geneva uh, Genocide Convention. So, so sometimes the legal scholars, policy analysts said, there's no physical uh, harm committed against the Uyghurs openly. Therefore, it's, it is, um, it is uh, too early to call it genocide. Let's, let's don't forget that when Nazi Germany, when Hitler's um, soldiers killing Jews, no one uh, asked a similar question. We did not say, oh, let's wait until this job is completed to determine. Actually, what is happening today 
fits the clear definition of a cultural genocide, to say the least, if not a genocide. So, um, and also the uh, ongoing, uh, the, the return of the slave, modern slavery in those 80 some uh, companies that the Australian think tank uh, identified also fits the practices of genocide uh, or crimes against humanity. As you may recall, um, after the Second World War, some of the industrialists uh, aided, abated the Nazi Germany, stood in trial in Nuremberg. So uh, the companies, academia, governments uh, have already been implicated in the ongoing uh, crisis. Uh, so I, I, I stop here and I'd be happy to take uh, questions as we go along. Thanks, Nuri. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think what you said right at the start there about um, about the fact that um, the international community, that is other governments, have really, while there's been some rhetoric from some of them, have not taken serious action. Uh, I think you know we know that so many com countries uh, and their and their big businesses are tied up in this and in the Belt and Road project that uh, the Chinese state has, um, and that at the end of the day, for all of the words they might say about human rights, um, they're putting they're putting that bottom line first, and that's why it's so important that campaigns from below, from from ordinary people, um, and and um, mass uh, mobilizations. Are, are brought to bear because our governments aren't going to act for us. Um, so thank you. I'm going to uh, ask Dibyesh to come in now. Um, Dibyesh uh, has to leave us at seven o'clock. Um, so uh, I'll make sure that if there are any questions specifically uh, for him, that uh, there's a chance to ask those quickly. Um, he's uh, Professor Dibyesh Anand is the head of the School of Business of sorry of Social Sciences at the University of Westminster and chairperson of the Westminster BME Staff Network. Uh, he's the author of Monographs uh, uh, Geopolitical Exotica: Tibet in Western Imagination and uh, Hindu Nationalism in India and the Politics of Fear. He's spoken about and published on various topics, including Tibet, the China-India border dispute. Hindu nationalism and Islamophobia in India, majority and minority relations in Asia, human rights, and the colonial occupation in Kashmir. Uh, Dibyesh, please, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, okay. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here. And it was good for Nuri to start because uh, he did provide the background of what's happening and how, what China is doing, what Uyghurs are suffering from, and why the international community is silent. So let me spend next five minutes, and I'll take five to six minutes on why China is doing. So let's focus on why, right? So of course, there's debate over whether it's genocide, cultural genocide. And in 2008, for instance, when there were massive protests in Tibet, and the Dalai Lama, the Tibetan religious and political leader, he used to talk about cultural genocide of Tibetans. And I found that a lot of Western academics, rather than appreciating why Tibetans use cultural genocide, started questioning whether it's genocide or not. Right. So my argument, first and foremost, would be whether it's genocide or not, is for people who are experiencing genocide or genocidal violence of all kinds to tell us whether it's genocide or not. I know that the international community focuses a lot on law and they would and we spend a lot of energy on to debating things. The fact of the matter is, at this point in time, for instance, if Uyghurs are experiencing and feeling of, of feeling that what they are experiencing back home is genocide, then we have to accept it as genocide. That's it. That's how we have to frame the debate, right? So it's genocide. Now, uh, if you look at why China is doing, and uh, let's say the re-education camp, right? And they talk of re-education. In fact, re-education is very much part and parcel of genocidal machinery. Re-education is something that the uh, Communist Party of China has been expert at in various parts of the world, or parts of the country. In particular, they use re-education very effectively. When I say effectively with inverted comma, right? Effectively means very brutally in Tibet since 1990s. And they have, of course, ratcheted up the rhetoric of re-education in, uh, in Xinjiang, with, in East Turkestan. From Chinese perspective, the reason for re-education is because, according to them, Uyghurs, Tibetans, or whoever they want to re-educate are not understanding how China loves them, right? So in a way, what China does, be it putting people under, in concentration camp, 
uh, incarcerating them forever, uh, surveilling them, killing them, putting them in the prison, and slave labor, all of that is in a way justified as labor of love. Because China loves Uyghur people. China loves Tibetan people, right? So if you look at the rhetoric propaganda of China, they'd never say that, of course, we are brutalizing uh, Uyghurs or Tibetans and, and everyone else. They would say, we are actually liberating them. We are loving them. And this is an important thing to bear in mind because a lot of time people outside would think, but you know, China is doing something wrong, but at least they're not colonizing, right? Because they're loving people. They're celebrating culture. So often we find images of Uyghur women in particular, but also Uyghur men you know, in the colorful dresses, singing and dancing and thanking, the, uh, thanking Beijing. It's an old propaganda of China. Right? They'd always have Tibetan people smiling and dancing. Even when people are self-immolating in protest, they'd be presented as someone who's happy. So we have to bear in mind a question, why would China insist that rather than brutalizing people, which all the evidence points that it's brutalizing people, it's loving people. That is because it's connected to a fundamental, re uh, fundamental nature of Chinese state. It is a colonizing state. So what we are experiencing, what we are witnessing, not experiencing, what we are witnessing in East Turkestan is a colonization of Uyghur people. Now, of course, colonization has been started. The very fact of Xinjiang, the new dominion, tells us that it's a colony, right, of uh, earlier the Qing Empire, now PRC. The PRC is very clear that it's a colony. But when we look at colonization by France or uh, Britain in, from 1850s or 60s onwards in Africa and Asia, that was a colonization which is forced to sort of loosen its control and negotiate with local collaborators. But what you're witnessing in case of Uyghurs and Tibetans in case of China, but also Kashmir in case of India and Kurds in case of uh, Turkey to an extent, right? All of them, we have, what we're witnessing is an ever closely entrenched colonization. Means whatever limited, not freedom, but whatever limited space Uyghurs had 20 years ago, they don't even have that now. So the, even that limited space to express themselves culturally, not politically. Remember, China never allowed Uyghurs to represent themselves politically. Even culturally, that's being squeezed. And the reason China does it, because it believes it can get away with it. The world will not look at it. The world will not criticize. It hopes that things like what we are doing now, what you have been doing, and Uyghurs would go silent and give up. So it's hoping people will give up. And ultimately, it has an immense hope that Uyghur people would actually accept Chinese occupation without any resistance. The way they would hope that Tibetan people accept occupation without any resistance, right? And the reason they do all of this is, and this is why it's important to bear in mind is, China is a colonial power. Now, China is a colonial power that claims that it's not colonial, that it's a victim of colonization. So for instance, if they see West ever criticizing China on Uyghurs or Tibetans, they would say, oh, that's because West is an imperialist power. Now, take example of why so many Muslim-majority countries signed that petition. Remember the petition in UN and other things in favor of China. Now, people would say for so business. It's not only business. If it was only business, then U.S. should get away with everything. U.S. also, you know, U.S. is a bully the way China is a bully. But China is more effective in its diplomacy and propaganda than U.S. is, frankly. So what we are witnessing, therefore, is China investing heavily in various countries countries, particularly not in Western world, in making sure that they not only do not support Uyghurs, but they actually support China. Right? Now, for instance, take example of India. India does not support China with Uyghurs, but it keeps quiet. Right? So the idea is you don't say anything on Kashmir, we will not say anything on Uyghurs and even Tibetans in the future. That's what India could proco is. But countries like Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and others who technically often speak of Muslims being suppressed in the world would keep silent over Uyghurs. And this is where our danger lies. Our danger lies with the fact that not only is China a colonial power and colonizing power, but China has been very effective in its propaganda that it's a victim of colonization by the West and Japan in the future. And therefore, it can never be colonial when there is no evidence that the fact that you have been colonized in the past means you will not be colonial. U.S. is a good example. U.S. was colonized by Britain, but then U.S. becomes a colonial imperial power of one kind, right? Same with China. So one way I would say for our campaigns to work, of course, is, and maybe during question answer, we can expand that. One way to uh, focus is work with other groups of Uyghurs, as 
in a way, thank you for having me because, of course, my connection to Uyghurs is largely in solidarity, but my work is largely around Kashmiris and Tibetans in different contexts, right? But they're very similar uh, struggles. One is to work with other similar movements to build solidarity. Second is also not give up on Muslim majority countries or non Western countries, global south, like it places countries like, you know, even Vietnam. Why not? So we have to work with different groups in different parts of the world to make sure that people, even if they can't speak in favor of Uyghurs, at least do not accept the Chinese propaganda that China is a power that loves Uyghur people rather than China as a colonial bully. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sibyesh. Yeah, that's that's that was really interesting. Um, and I think you're you're absolutely right. I agree with you that um, we need to talk about uh, about this as imperialism, as colonization. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to bring in now uh, Rahima Mahmoud. Rahima has been involved in our um, in the Uyghur Solidarity Campaign from the start. Uh, and long before this campaign came into existence uh, uh, on, on the issue. Um, she's a singer, a human rights activist, um, an award-winning translator. Uh, her latest work has involved um, consulting and translating for documentaries uh, like um, the ITV's um, Inside China's Dig Digital Gulag and the BBC's China New World Order. And she's the UK project director for the World Uyghur Congress. Um, so please, Rahima, I'll hand over to you. Hello, everyone, and thank you um, for the for organising this. First of all, uh, David and Ben and the rest of the uh, the group, and also uh, brilliant speakers, um, Nori and. Uh, Debesh, and I, I'm really um, impressed with the uh, in-depth explanation, and uh, because I believe that people need to know um, from the experts um, about what what is happening and why. But I would like just to talk about uh, more on the um, what we should do or what we're doing. Um, in UK on our campaign. And uh, first of all, today is actually 30th anniversary of uh, Baron Uprising. And so 30 years ago today, in a town um, called the Baron in Aktu County, um, it's a place, um, the region is bordered with Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Um, there was an uprise. Uh, about 200 men uh, marched to the uh, government uh, building and demanding for uh, greater rights and uh, um, a protest against CCP's discrimination policies and the cultural uh, restrictions on Uyghur people, and also demand uh, stop the mass influx of the Chinese. Uh, migra migrants. And for this, uh, the, the Chinese government, as usual, brought in military and crushed uh, the, this, uh, this uprise. It lasted for five days from um, the 5th of April to the 10th of April. And uh, um, we believe uh, up to 3,000 uh, Uyghurs um, were killed uh, during that period. Uh, they brought in um, tens of thousands of the military, the Baron, the population, only 19,000 uh, at that time. And uh, this was uh, one of the uh, maybe biggest uprise and a bit, uh, the, in this uh, latest uh, history of uh, East Turkestan in uh, beginning in the 90s. Um, so I, I feel it's, uh, it's a, a good coincidence that we organized this also to commemorate uh, this day uh, for us to show that we haven't for, uh, uh, forgotten um, this um, heavy loss of life. 
Um, also, the second thing I would like to bring to your attention is about this latest um, press ganging, uh, the Uyghur youth that the Chinese government, it started from mid-March and thousands of um, Uyghurs were transferred from, uh, especially from the south, southern um, part of East Turkestan, um, Khotan, Kashkar, and many other regions. So I want to just read out one uh, statement from one person who I, actually, I, um, I got this information uh, from a friend. Um, so on March 17, the Chinese, the Chinese authorities press ganged approximately 1,000 Uyghur young men and women who were picked up from their homes, workplaces, and off the streets and placed them in a school in Khotan city, which was shut down due to the coronavirus. According to a young, uh, a young man who was among these youth, around 700 of them are from Kashgar County and the rest, uh, uh, Karakash County, sorry, from the Karakash County and the rest are from Khotan city. They spent the night in, in the school without being provided blankets or food and water. On the morning of March 18, they were headed to the train station and were told that they were traveling to Urumqi, where they will be start a new job. On arrival in uh, Urumqi on March 19, they were taken to a building on the outskirts of Urumqi, where they spent the night in a large hall without being provided with blankets, despite the weather being extremely cold. On the morning of March 20, they were dispersed into small groups of 10 to 15 people before being taken to different buses. So this young man, for safety reason, we cannot reveal his name, who kept in contact with uh, this friend uh, who lives in Turkey, and revealed that the police visited his home on the 15th of March, informing his mother that he will be taken to the Altai region for work. And when his mother questioned the police saying, my son already has a job here, the police told her that it is the order from the above and he must comply. After arriving in Urumqi, he was sent to a drink factory along with nine other youths owned by one of the Xinjiang production and the construction cops known as XPCC or Bingtuan. So as we already know uh, that two to three million um, Uyghur people along with other Turkic Muslims in the uh, concentration camps and other, they are already the source for the forced labor. And this new trend of press ganging the Uyghur youth and dispersing them to factories uh, in Chinese constructive uh, construction cops in East Turkestan and mainland China is another method of accelerating the Chinese assimilation policy. In other words, the Uyghur cultural genocide. So uh, I will stop here and then uh, maybe uh, I take questions if any, anyone want to know about more uh, what the campaigns is happening in the UK. Thank you. Hi, uh, Rahima, thank you very much. Um, apologies to those reading the, um, the text chat. We've got some uh, racist spammers in there. They uh, can't talk to us though, so they're basically just wasting their time. Um, I'm gonna ask David to speak now. Um, David uh, is a labor movement activist, a trade unionist um, who has organized this campaign from the start. Um, he wrote the uh, proposal to the Labour Party, which was adopted, uh, I think, unanimously at last September's Labour conference, um, which, uh, which uh, saw the Labour Party in this country adopt a position of firm solidarity with the Uyghur people um, to act uh, take action against the Chinese government to, to force and uh, demand uh, freedom. So, um, David, um, I'll hand over to you. 
Thank you, Ben. Um, just, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to talk, I, 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 really interesting to hear what the other speakers have said, and I, um, I'm going to talk mostly about um, the campaign, why I and a few other co comrades um, decided to set up the campaign and what we're trying to do. Um, I very much agree with the points that other panellists have made, in particular um, uh, what DBS was talking about in terms of this being a what China's doing is a, 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 a national oppression um, of, a, uh, of a people. Um, it's often talked about, and I'll come back to this actually, but just in terms of some of the issues, but it's often talked about in terms of issues like religious freedom, which is definitely important and a part of the picture, but I think sometimes obscures um, that uh, this is to do with um, a much broader um, suppression of uh, the rights of a, uh, a people to um, uh, express their national identity, their cultural identity, and so on. Um, in terms of the campaign, so why we the Solidarity Campaign? Um, so um, I set this up with the support of a few comrades, um, really in order to mobilise support for the Uyghur people and for Uyghur human rights uh, from the labour movement here in the UK. Um, uh, we had, uh, as Ben mentioned just now, we had an opportunity early on um, to be able to put an emergency motion to Labour Party conference. Um, uh, my CLP, which is Finchley and Golders Green CLP, had agreed uh, a few months previously um, to take a position on campaigning for the Uyghurs um, to pressing uh, Labour Party representatives, including the leadership, to do more on this issue, to speak up. Um, I wrote a motion for conference. Um, there's, there's basically ways you have to write motions in, uh, in order to get them taken as emergency motion. It needs to kind of uh, relate to recent events, um, which uh, I was able to do. Um, to be honest, I was quite surprised when it made it onto the conference agenda, but um, that was certainly great we managed to do that. Um, in the conference itself, it received very little attention because it was alongside other policy motions as part of a wide ranging international debate, which at the time including Brexit um, and uh, the war in Yemen and Palestine, um, it, it, it sort of got crowded out in terms of debate, but um, nevertheless was carried either unanimously or almost unanimously, certainly overwhelmingly in the vote. Um, uh, meanwhile, um, a few of us decided that we, what we wanted to do was organize monthly protests outside the Chinese embassy. This was inspired really by two things. One, that, that, that um, the Uyghur community in London has been organizing protests uh, in particular on the 5th of February and on the 5th of um, July. Um, uh, it, as commemorative anniversary protests and obviously in response to the current uh, level of persecution and repression. Um, uh, it was also inspired by Andrew, who's a, 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 another member of my local, uh, my, my constituency Labour Party, who's been um, uh, carrying out protests um, outside the Chinese Embassy cultural section in Hampstead on a weekly basis. Um, and we wanted to do something in central London on a monthly basis. We, we, we decided we'd do the fifth day of every month because we already had some protests on the fifth of the month. As it turns out, Rahim has told us about another, uh, uh, in fact, another anniversary um, as well uh, today. Um, and the protests have been important, that, uh, I think. They, they've helped to engage and mobilize the campaign. Um, we've uh, involved, and I'll talk about why in particular, but we've involved, for example, Labour Party politicians. Um, very pleased to see that um, that uh, Julie Ward is, is uh, here in the meeting. I think I saw Julie on the chat before all the awful stuff. And then and see her comment again. Um, Julie spoke at, um, our, at one of our protests. Um, Julie, uh, Julie was a member of the European Parliament until Britain no longer had members of the European Parliament at the end of January um, for the Labour Party and has been particularly 
a, a strong advocate for human rights around the world. Um, and we had uh, messages of support from Labour MPs. We had uh, trade unionists speaking, um, in particular, John Maloney, who's the Assistant General Secretary of the PCS, which is the main civil service union, uh, spoke on behalf of the PCS, which has taken a stand in support of um, Uyghur solidarity campaigning and Uyghur human rights. Um, and we've had support from uh, local trade union branches, particularly in London. Um, uh, Peter Tatchell, who's a prominent human rights campaigner, many people will know, um, spoke as well. Um, and of course, we have Rahima, who's spoken regularly. So we, we have, um, uh, that's been important in terms of um, trying to uh, um, gain, gaining a wider hearing and influence for the issue, really. Um, uh, and, and I have to confess that probably um, uh, two years ago, I probably didn't know anything about what, what China was doing in East Turkestan and doing to the Uyghur people. Um, the, there was very little media coverage. Um, part, pardon me there. Um, the computer wasn't plugged in. Um, and um, so it's been important to... to um, let people know what's happening to gain a hearing for support. The um, there was another. I briefly mentioned there was another initiative, in particular, try to which was to try to get the conference policy commitment into Labour's manifesto for the general election. Um, we uh, so we ran a campaign about that. Um, it was to some extent successful um, in that I, I, I believe it's the first time that a major political party manifesto in the UK has mentioned the Uyghurs in China as an issue, um, which it mentioned briefly. Um, it was disappointing on the level of not saying more and not saying what the issue is, but nevertheless, um, it, it was important uh, insofar as it went and it was an important achievement. Um, the, uh, so why, why, why Labour in particular? Obviously, Labour Party is in opposition. Um, and so less of a position to take action than the Tories who are in government. And it's important that we put campaigning pressure on governments everywhere, including on our own government here in the UK. We want governments around the world to put pressure on the Chinese state uh, to lift the persecution um, of the Uyghurs um, and uh, to win freedom, to win human rights. Um, that, that in itself is easier said than done because of China's immense power, um, economically, militarily, and so on, um, which it then uses for, for diplomatic purposes. Um, however, uh, why the Labour Party in particular, and that really relates to something that Ben mentioned earlier, which is that um, uh, that the Labour movement, as a movement, um, is has great potential and power to uh, mobilise um, big, big numbers of people um, who can, uh, if, if they're organized, um, in particular working people, workers who are organized, um, are able to um, uh, put pressure on governments. Now, it's, now, we've seen that in the past. We've seen that in, for example, uh, the role of the um, trade unions in South Africa, um, really playing a central role in, in um, eventually bringing down apartheid in South Africa. We, it's not um, a coincidence that China um, bans independent trade unions. So the only trade unions in China basically are state labor fronts. Um, even so, there are sometimes strikes in China and, and, and um, uh, which are generally heavily repressed by the state. But you know, the, these things break out from time to time. Um, and in fact, the experience of Hong Kong shows that uh, where there are independent unions allowed, um, shows that they uh, they can have a, a, a strong impact on um, um, in terms of mobilizing people in terms of putting pressure on government and so on um, also um, trade unions the level of international solidarity um, can have an impact and you know we've seen examples over the years um, perhaps in particular the uh, um, 1973 with the military coup in uh, Chile um, by um, General Pinochet and um, 
there was a, 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 a response from uh, workers, trade unionists in um, East Kilbride in Scotland, who were working, who were engineers working on maintenance of, um, uh, of, of military aircraft uh, uh, for the Chilean Air Force. Um, who down tools and refused to work on it because of the military coup, because of what happened. So there, there, there are examples of that. Now, China is not in the position of relying on on foreign countries to uh, maintain its air force or, or its weapons, but there is a connection with companies uh, and businesses and industries around the world, and we need to do what we can to uh, mobilize support at the grassroots level. Um, we have a huge task um, in doing this, uh, it, and we have a, a big political problem as well um, in the UK, um, really to do, uh, and that's to do with um, the, the legacy of Stalinism in the Labour movement. And so, uh, for example, um, if you go to a trade union conference, you go to a Labour Party conference, uh, you go on a Labour movement demonstration, it's quite uh, typical that you will see people handing out, usually for free, handing out the Morning Star newspaper. Now, the Morning Star, um, if you search on their website um, for uh, uh, articles or issues to do with the, the Uyghurs, um, then uh, what you find um, are, you don't find articles that explain um, the, uh, the oppression that the, the Uyghurs are suffering at the hands of the Chinese state. Um, what you find are articles which say this is an issue of um, the US government trying to interfere in, in the internal matters of China. Um, now, you know, the, an element of, the, of what's going on is an argument between the USA and China. To put it mildly, I'm no fan of, of Donald Trump and the US government. Um, however, um, it, it, the, for the most part, what the US government is doing is seizing on issues that they know are real issues, um, uh, and that's why they're powerful. That's why that you know that's an effective uh, line of attack from their point of view. Um, the other thing I would say about that is that um, the fact that the US Congress passed the Uyghur Human Rights Act um, is unquestionably a good thing and I want to see other countries do the same. Um, the, uh, the fact that, that it sounds like that's not been implemented is, um, is the problem, not the fact that politicians in the USA are taking notice of this issue. But um, what the morning, the morning Star deflects firstly onto the issue of um, saying this is just a, a kind of power play between the USA and China. Secondly, to say Oh, this is about religious freedom, but no, no, no. We've we've asked we've asked the Chinese government representatives, and they say it's okay. In China, um, they they're not even interested in 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 the idea that this is a, a question of national oppression um, that requires well, actually, that requires even even um, human rights, um, e even the kind of limited human rights um, that um, Uyghurs. Uh, were able to have even a, a decade or two ago, um, uh, let alone um, let alone national liberation in a, a more general sense. Um, the so the Morning Star, unfortunately, and those kind of politics are still very influential in our movement. Um, we have a big job to do, really, um, to challenge that. We've 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 made some progress. We do have uh, support from a number of Labour MPs. Um, we, uh, as I say, we've uh, gained um, some progress in terms of um, in terms of uh, trade union um, support, in particular, uh, as I said before, the PCS union, but so, some local trade union branches as well, branches of the RMT, um, Unison, and the NEU. Um, we will continue to uh, promote that, and actually, that's one thing we can do more of the i think we have a bit more time to do uh, we can't do we can't do the protests on the street um because of what's going on at the moment what we can do is try to um get those ideas out to more um to more local trade union representatives and say please take this up for us um so on on that point i'll, I'll leave it there um, and hand back thank you
Thanks, Dave. Um, uh, we'll just hear now from uh, Jack from the world one who was uh, the uh, sixth form student who founded who founded alongside others, I think, the One World Movement uh, that co-organised the rally this January, um, uh, calling for solidarity with the Hong Kongers, the Uyghurs, and the Tibetans uh, against the crimes of the Chinese state. Um, Jack, if I can hand over to you, please. Hello. Oh, so yeah, Sorry it's, about it's that. Definitely, no, no worries. Um, it's definitely co-founded. Um, oh, you've got some of our members in here. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Jack. I'm speaking on behalf of a group of activists known as the One World Movement. Firstly, I want to say thank you to the organisers of today's talk. Your ingenuity to carry on with your monthly protest using alternative methods is highly impressive. In particular, I'd like to thank Rahima for the invitation um, and for her help in making our first rally what it was. We're a team of students and young adults of whom hope to raise awareness of the plight of the Uyghur people, as well as the Hong Kongers, the Tibetans and the Turkey peoples, etc. As well as raising awareness, we also aim to combat influence of the Chinese Communist Party within the UK, with a focus being to encourage the banning um, of Huawei funding at UK universities. I'm sure you all know that that is a massive problem. And also challenging Chinese governmental influence at different student unions. Um, if you've been kind of keeping an eye on the news in the kind of months leading up to the current lockdown, you'd have seen an increasing frequency um, in relation to uh, incidents at student unions say uh, members would call on others to report people back to or report people to officials back home um, etc so uh, as young britons we believe that companies such as huawei who actively facilitate the cultural genocide of the uyghur people in east turkestan should not be allowed a foothold to launder reputation and profit within the united kingdom as such we will act quietly yet ruthlessly to expose the true nature of such companies to our fellow to our fellow countrymen and women in attempt to weaken their standing. On this note, we would love to work with the groups present today to carry out this aim to its fullest extent. extent. It's imperative that the youth of the UK stand with us in this fight against dictatorship. They stand for freedom, democracy, and human rights. We ourselves have the opportunity to, and the privilege to enjoy our youth, and so it's our duty to speak for those who do not have this chance. It's our goal as a group to promote such ideals. We cannot allow oppression to go unanswered wherever it may be in the world, and in particular with the case of the Uyghurs. Um, so, they, yeah, there's uh, kind of little else I can say on that, um, just that we, as British students, we stand with you, um, like the Uyghur people. We will do whatever we can to help you, and we want to work more closely with everyone here to act on that. Um, that's all I can say, really. Just thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a great note to uh, to move to open discussion um, because uh, let's we, this is a good opportunity, I think, for us to think about how we can be working together um, and uh, taking action. Um, we've uh, we had hoped that by now, in, if we weren't under lockdown, we'd be upping our campaign against not just Huawei, but all of the companies that have, were, have been implicated in the reports of forced labor. Uh, at the end of our last embassy demonstration a month ago, although that feels like a year, um, a lot of the people at the protest, we marched down to Oxford Street and we briefly occupied the um, storefronts of Nike, H&M uh, &M and Microsoft, all of whom have been implicated. Uh, and at the end of this discussion, uh, Sarah, another organiser of the protest, is going to tell us about um, a bit of action that we've got cooked up that we'd like people to help build um, that we can take online. But uh, I'd like to hand it over to the audience. Thanks for listening. We hope you found that useful and informative. I'd like to tell you about the protest we're organising. At 2pm UK time, on Tuesday the 14th of April 2020, we're going to be protesting to demand that Apple cut its ties with the forced Uyghur labour programmes. So please join us at 2pm on Tuesday. We'll be calling Apple's customer service line on 0800 048 0408 and contacting them on social media. That's at Apple on Instagram and Twitter. Please do be polite.
The people that work in their call centres aren't responsible for their boss's policies, but please do make that message heard loud and clear. Let's flood their, their social media channels and their phone lines. If you're listening after the 14th of April, hopefully we'll be organising more of these protests targeting the many companies that are implicated in this scandal. So please check our social media and get involved. Thanks for your support. Keep following the campaign, keep taking part. Stay safe and goodbye.